In the name of Jesus. Amen. In our collect today, we prayed that the Lord would so order the course of our world peaceably that the church may joyfully serve in all godly quietness. It's a beautiful thing to pray, and a good thing to pray in our day, I think, when you take a look at our nation on July 5th, having gone through what, not only what we have gone through, but what the world has gone through over the past six months. But consider when this collect, this prayer, was initially written. It's attributed to Pope Leo the Great, who lived in about 450 AD. He was sent to speak with Attila in order to call off the invading hordes who would have raided Rome and ransacked it. Later, he endured the sacking of Rome by the Vandal King Genesaric in about 455 uh, AD. And so if there's a person who knows about trial and tribulation, about living in a world without quietness, about enduring persecution and destruction, it's Leo. And now, with that context, what an appropriate thing to pray, not only by Leo, but also by us in this day. For we may not be surrounded by vandal hordes, but we are certainly embattled, surrounded by a host of invisible and visible enemies. So also Paul writes about this for us today. We know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. And why does the creation groan? It has been subjected to futility. Thorns and thistles inhabit the land. Famine and disaster and plague come upon us instead of fruitfulness. Multiplication doesn't happen in the way that it should. Instead, children die in the womb. And not only that, but we have too many people, some say, or too few. And so how do you approach this matter of multiplication? Any answer that the world gives outside of Scripture most likely leads to destruction. Creation groans in the pains of childbirth longing. Longing for what? Freedom from corruption. And also, looking for the adoption of us as sons. And so creation then groans in this expectation of that which is coming. Creation groans in hope, looking forward to the birth of that child, or in our case, the rebirth of us, not only in the waters of holy baptism, but in the resurrection of all flesh. Along with the groaning of the creation, we too groan. And why do we groan? We groan not because of a corruption that has been visited upon us, but instead a corruption that resulted from us. It's our fault. Our father, Adam, is the one who ate and brought sin in. And now we, having inherited this same sin, original sin, face the corruption of our flesh. The devil, the world, and our sinful nature 
all team together seeking to deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. But being adopted as sons, we know that there is salvation for us. We know that there is protection for us. For the Lord is the one who is our strength. The Lord is the one who is our stronghold. The Lord is the one who is our salvation. It is the Lord who then continues to be our light, our salvation. Whom shall I fear? Not the devil, the world, or our sinful nature. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. Whom shall I be afraid? Of death? By no means. Instead, we flee to the one who dwelt in darkness upon the cross, becoming our salvation, for he takes upon himself our damnation. In his weakness, he becomes our stronghold. Through his death, we have life. So of what shall I be afraid? Shall evildoers assail us to eat up our flesh? They might try. Yet they cannot, for the ones who sought to eat up his flesh failed miserably. It is on the third day coming forth from the grave, the first fruits, no, even better, the firstborn from the dead. Our head is now leading us from this death to life. And even as he leads us, we await this, this e with eager expectation the life which is yet to come. So it is that Paul then can write, I consider the sufferings of this present life are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us in the life which is yet to come. And so let the devil, the world, and our sinful nature attack. We may groan, but we groan in expectation, knowing that we, the body of Christ, will soon be brought out of this death to life, be brought from birth to true life in him. For where the head has gone, as you know with birth, so also the body will go. But that is not all that comfortable. You don't remember this, thanks be to God, and hopefully your mothers don't either. But going through childbirth is a painful process for the child as well as the mother, filled with, with tears, cries of agony, and distress but then there's that moment where the child is brought to his mother's chest after he has been delivered into the world and there is great joy so also we now go through this life groaning and suffering and yet there is a time which is yet to come when we will have the fullness of joy. For now, we live within this body of Christ, suffering and yet finding joy in him. Daily groaning, yet finding our peace in him. Being trained up to recognize the log that's sticking in our own eyes before we seek the speck that is in our neighbor's eyes. And that's only possible by confession and absolution. The removal of the log, then, is the recognition of the sin that I have committed, not only against my fellow man, but against God himself. This is why it's so good to sing a, 
a hymn like we did today with the third stanza, for I find too often that my mouth gets me in trouble. Maybe you do too. But listen to these words. Keep me from saying words that later need recalling. Oh, Lord, that's a good thing to pray, isn't it? Guard me lest idle speech may from my lips be fallen. But when within my place I must and ought to speak, then to my words give grace lest I offend the weak. So there it is, the log sticking out of my own eye, coming really from my own mouth, which the Lord wants to remove from me. And he does so. I confess this unto him. He, he takes that painful piece of wood, that painful sin from me, and places it right back to the cross of wood where it belongs. And then he cleanses the wound which was there because of sin. He cleanses it through the baptismal waters. He cleanses it through the, the medication provided in his body and blood. He provides to me and to you healing. And that then enables us to speak to our brothers and sisters as Joseph once did. Not holding the speck that's in our brother's eye against him, but instead proclaiming forgiveness for him. That is only possible for your Father who is merciful also makes you merciful. That word there, by the way, is not eleison or eleo in Greek. Instead, we're, we're dealing with a different Greek word, a really beautiful little Greek word, oitirmanos, and that means pity or mercy or compassion. But it's pity, mercy, and compassion in action. It's not in the abstract, like I love something. Instead, I love my wife and I show her this by getting her flowers or, or making her breakfast. It's love that's moved forth in action. So also, this type of mercy comes forth in action. And so when I need to, when I ought to speak to my neighbor about his sin, it's done so in order to restore him through the forgiveness of sins. It's not to rub salt in a wound or cause him to suffer further. But instead, it's to take away that suffering. For Christ, who has once suffered for all sins, now gives to us this balm, this forgiveness, this restoration, this renewal, this protection from the devil, this salvation from condemnation. And so we keep praying. We keep praying not only that the Lord would guard our mouths and our minds in his peace, but we also pray for deliverance finally from this suffering, groaning life. First, in this present day, through the forgiveness of sins, but then in the day which is yet to come, the redemption of our bodies, the resurrection of all flesh, when all suffering and groaning ends, and we finally experience true joy and peace. Lord, grant that that day may come. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Okay.